overwhelming margins for you. I think the challenge for Democrats and the opportunity for Democrats is to do the same thing on their side. So, for instance, right now you see uh, a piece of legislation in Congress that's around prevention, um, preventing abortions, and that, that's actually got a wide variety of liberal and conservative Democrats and some Republicans co-sponsoring that legislation. I think you will see a very strong effort on the Democratic side for people to try and reach out to the center, the religious center. I, I don't know if this will be successful or not, but I think that that's the struggle you're going to see as people try to keep this kind of centrist coalition together. And Sam and, and David, could that be successful as people are doing that kind of outreach? And, and, and if that kind of outreach is made, does that also bring people into a dialogue around a broader set of issues? Together? It, it could be. In, in, the, in the broadening of the classical traditional values narrative, uh, I, I think, and I'm not being presumptuous here, I, I hope, but the Hispanic American voter is going to play a significant part in, in bringing together, you, be it the progressive or the conservatives, you can't engage the Hispanic electorate without addressing faith issues, without addressing La Familia issues, and without addressing, once again, that, that social justice, I call the prophetic ethos of the Hispanic American people. Uh, so in, in the mix of that, right now it's about 6.5% of the registered voters and 23% grew up in the past couple of years. It, it could be very well be between 8.5-10% of the total votes cast in 2008. Hispanic American voters could easily be that bridge between both sides of the aisle in presenting a viable, uh, sorry for this, you know, uh, you know, plethora of, of, of terminology in respect to combining terms that we should not do according <laughs> to the 11th commandment, but it will be the Hispanic American being that conservative progressive individual, uh, bringing it together, uh, these ideas and it broadening the menu. I think the Hispanic American voter will be, histor will be historically responsible for expanding the, the menu of what we have traditionally labeled as values or, or faith-driven initiatives and issues. And in lieu of that, great coalitions are about to be formed, particularly uh, in urban areas around America. Right now we're seeing an incredible alliance of Hispanic and African American constituencies that was never seen before. Uh, we're seeing Hispanic Americans and Asian Americans in California coming together and addressing issues in certain cities. Uh, so we're seeing the Hispanic American voter as this coalition builder. And I think that's going to make some significant inroads in the next election. You know, I, um, I I think back, I came to Washington in, in, in like 1990. Uh, Jerry Falwell had disbanded the moral majority in June of 89, I believe. And everyone was declaring the religious right dead. You know, there were dialogues, probably not dissimilar to this one. Because there had been a televangelist scandals, Falwell and Swag no, Falwell, well, maybe Swaggart and and, uh, and Baker and others uh, had, uh, had, had, you know, been embroiled in controversy. Falwell had tried to bear, bail out James Jim, Jimmy Baker. Um, anyway, but but the point is, while everyone was having this other discussion about the religious right being dead and and the future of the Republican Party, in September of 1989, while no one was paying attention, you know, there was a small meeting in Atlanta, Georgia, where the Christian Coalition was founded. And from 1989, 1990, 91, 92, no one paid attention to this growing religious right movement. You know, Family Research Council had been founded around that same period of time. 1992, there's the Houston Convention, you know, the quote-unquote the Jihad. Uh, Bush loses. Again, the religious right is dead. And this is this continuing narrative after every time the Republicans lose. You know, it is somehow that there's this fundamental shift going on with the religious right and, and that things are changing. And I think we need to recognize the fact that, you know, by and large, the religious right is not going to change unless the religious right is engaged in some serious dialogue by other people of faith, who share their faith, who they respect with the same faith. Um, and I think that's the, that's, you know, to the degree that that doesn't happen, then over the next two years, while there's this dialogue about what may or may not be happening with the God Gap, the religious right is going to be reorganizing, re-energizing, and it will deal a devastating defeat in 2008, and Republicans will take over Congress and win the White House. And the next conversation like this will be, wow, what happened in the last two years? And, and I, I do not say that to be discouraging, but I say that because there are certain facts that need to be addressed. Number one, you know, 
when we talk about the diverse issue, the diverse set of, of religions other than the, the Judeo-Christian tradition in America, they represent a remarkably tiny percentage of the electorate. I mean, Anna, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we're talking less than 5%. Yeah, about 3%. Yeah, 3% of Hindus and Buddhists and Jains and, and everybody else. I'm not saying that's bad, or I'm just, but politically, that needs to be understood. Uh, when you look at sort of, sort of the ultra-wedge issues, like gay marriage, I think that the polling still shows that you know, the majority of Americans oppose gay marriage regardless of, you know, it's not just a religious right issue to oppose gay marriage. I mean, among Hispanics, among African Americans, you know, there's still a majority of people you know, who aren't members of the ultra-religious right that you know, object to gay marriage. And so, you know, I think that we need to be careful about you know, drawing these distinctions. Um, and I think that over the next two years, what has to happen is there has to be this engagement of the religious right, particularly of religious right leaders, uh, and, and a challenge of them about the issues that they are presenting as the most important issues. Because frankly, if you went to the grassroots evangelical and you told them that, you know, for instance, the Family Research Council, you know, the largest of the groups, you know, has as their you know, legislative priority of the most important things in the country. You know, number two is defunding the ACLU. Uh, oh, number three is defunding Planned Parenthood. Now, protecting private property rights is number nine. And that nowhere on here is poverty. Nowhere on here you know, is HIV AIDS in Africa. Nowhere on here is Darfur. Nowhere on here are any of the issues that Anna talks about as being important uh, in the polling that Jim Wallace has talked about on common ground issues. And to be able to talk to them and say, hold on a second, look at what your what your religious right leadership is talking about, and look at their issues. And I think that's an engagement that has to happen. And I think some of it can happen from within the Democratic Party. And I think that uh, that's a distinction that we need to, to make. Because on, honestly, if we get to the point of thinking, well, we're going to merge red and we're going to merge blue, we get purple. America's not purple. <laughs> if I could yeah. jump in here, the, there is a... Uh, there is some excitement going on from uh, the so-called religious right, uh, and um, the excitement is that there are leaders who are slowly uh, uh, starting to bring forward uh, the notion that uh, while we're going to stick with our uh, pro-life and against gay marriage uh, points of view and, and we'll never moderate them, that we're going to start adding to this agenda. And, and David, your book I think is an important part of the dialogue, uh, but the National Association of Evangelicals has uh, in, in, in this past year uh, taken a, a, a big uh, a big role in talking about climate change and, and uh, the environment as an issue of climate, uh, as an issue of creation care and talking about what would Jesus drive and talking about how uh, we are responsible as stewards for God's creation. And uh, we're seeing right now uh, the potential marriage between two uh, incredibly uh, antagonistic uh, uh, parties of science and faith uh, on this uh, uh, global warming climate change issue where, uh, you know, since Galileo and Copernicus were fighting with the Vatican all the way till today in the creation uh, versus evolution debate, they're, they're usually at loggerheads, but right now, uh, we have a, a growing movement of, of clergy, including evangelicals, who are recognizing that uh, this is a moral crisis. This isn't just a scientific or technological issue, but a, a moral issue. And I, and I am very hopeful uh, that uh, we can reach a tipping point on issues like climate change when clergy in the congregations follow this, uh, this growing national movement and, and let the individuals understand that uh, they can go home and make moral decisions by turning the lights off and turning their thermostat down and buying a hybrid or fuel efficient car. And that uh, that kind of uh, uh, advocacy from the pulpit as opposed to political advocacy can be the types of things that will help us really solve these issues that, again, these are values that we all share whatever our religious or lack of religious beliefs and whatever our partisan preferences are. And so I'm seeing some excitement and hopefully that uh, when the two sides uh, are able to agree on something that's complex and, and, and is uh, complex as climate change, then they can also join forces on issues like poverty and injustice and these other shared values that, I, that are, are so important to our society as well as our nation's history. I, I look at it through the eyes of a pastor, and I think one of the statistics that came out in, uh, in October in a poll that was taken, 83% of evangelical pastors in Ohio uh, on the governor's race were going to vote for uh, Mr. Blackwell. 